performance management and data analyst. Um, as uh, I've shared before, racial tensions arising from police brutality nationwide and COVID-19 pandemic have made implementation of the racial equity and social justice law crucial in our communities. I want to thank everyone for progress to date. Thank you, Ms. Ward, for the annual report, which we all received on September 30th of this year, consistent with the law. It was very helpful, and I hope that today's presentation will touch upon the salient points in that report. Since the first briefing uh, that we had, we um, have made a lot of strides, I believe, that deserve to be celebrated. Um, so we now have a robust Office of Legislative Oversight, Racial Equity and Social Justice Legislative Review Tool. The tool is designed to apply racial equity and social justice lens to the development and review of proposed legislation in the county. Um, we have racial equity and social justice impact statements that are being issued. Uh, as I said, the first annual report from the Office of Racial Justice and Social Equity was released on time. This was September 30th, 2020. There's been a lot of training and awareness as well as data gathering, uh, as well as discussions that are taking place. Um, and so for me, this really marks progress. Um, this year on October uh, 12th, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day for the first time in Montgomery County, uh, thanks to a resolution that I spearheaded in this council adopted and, uh, unanimously in July. We now recognize the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day. The law continues to be a living, breathing instrument of justice and equity. Um, I also recently introduced a bill supported by all my colleagues that would increase the membership of the Racial Equity and Social Justice Advisory Commission by two public members and give the county executive flexibility to create a fixed committees to tackle specific issues. It also clarifies that zoning text amendments would require racial equity and social justice impact statements and that is very important because land use decisions are really critical to this work. And as I said earlier, well, we welcome uh, into the county council team, Theo Holt, um, and he is the county council's ra uh, first racial equity and social justice performance management specialist and data analyst. That's a long title. Welcome. So today, as we go through the packet, I would be interested um, in hearing about challenges that remain uh, in meeting any aspect of the law um, especially uh, with regards to capacity issues, um, which I think are really important issues for us to examine, especially as the uh, county executive and his departments are right now beginning to do the work of crafting a budget request for uh, FY22. Um, I think that we need to make sure that this work has the appropriate resources and capacity in order to make this um, uh, reality and uh, make sure that it meets the expectations of our constituents. So let me now turn it over to um, Mr. Drummer to walk us through um, the packet. Um, unless any of my colleagues have any comments, um, they can always text me or just wave and I'll recognize you. Um, but let's start and welcome Council Member Jawando. Um, if not, we'll just start to go through the packet and then we'll you know, pause and uh, have a conversation uh, as well. And of course, Ms. Ward would then also have an opportunity to present as well as uh, Dr. Bonner Tompkins as, um, as we go along. Uh, Mr. Drummer. Okay, good afternoon. I promise not to mention impact taxes or recreation taxes. That'd be great. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, after this, after I've just thing already this did. One. You already did. I know, I already did. Yeah. I meant, Anymore. Well, the days get blurred, so, you know, yeah. it's hard to remember what topic this, this is today. Uh, yeah. You know, you've kind of laid out what I, pretty much what I was going to say. Uh, you know, we have a new principal office. Tiffany Ward is here. She's the director. Uh, I believe the original budget had one position and two more were added by a supplemental appropriation. And uh, the biggest thing that is still yet to come would be the method to regulation coming from the executive's office, which I know they've started work on working with the county attorney's office. Uh, all of the, or not many of the departments and maybe all of them have designated a 
racial equity and social justice lead for the council. Uh, we've got Selena Singleton has been designated as our lead and, uh, OLO has actually done some training for council staff and uh, has uh, hired Theo Holt, who's uh, going to be helping to prepare, I guess, primarily responsible for preparing the impact statements for bills and, uh, and soon probably zoning text amendments. Uh, he's already started preparing impact uh, statements. The first one is attached to the packet. Um, and I think you'd probably be better off listening to uh, Tiffany and, uh, and Elaine and uh, maybe Theo and uh, having me try and parrot what they said in their reports. They have uh, they've each attached a memorandum explaining how what they've been doing. And uh, I've also attached the bill just for public viewing in case somebody is wondering where it comes from. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, we'll start with you, Ms. Ward. Tell us uh, what's, what's going on, updates, and the status of, of your work. Yeah. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a busy seven months, has it been? Ooh almost wow, so busy seven months. Um, I think I laid out in our, our first annual report kind of the framework of what the work has looked like over the last six or seven months. It really um, has looked like normalizing these conversations within the county government. I think we did a great job of doing our community conversations throughout the community. Uh, I think that people were very much um, enthusiastic about the work that we were starting. Um, and so the second, I'll say the, the next leg was really seeding this work with our employees. So, so I'd uh, done quite a few um, presentations to our management staff, our senior level management, as well as our MLS managers and other employees to talk to them about what racial equity and social justice is, what the expectation is for them, uh, both in the examination of their policies and procedures, what um, what the what the expectation will be um, from the executive and how that will go and what the timeline was. So it was a so far it's been pretty well received. There's been a little bit of I won't say pushback, but there's been a little bit of question of why racial equity and not equity. And so I've spent a good amount of time just talking about terms and definitions. Um, and so and really having people understand the framework that we're starting with and why we are using this framework. Uh, why we are trying to get to the root cause, what desperate disparate outcomes are and gaps are, and um, really helping people grasp a systems level um, change instead of programmatic level change has been um, has been really interesting. Um, and while the normalizing, organizing, and operationalizing uh, has been our framework, uh, I really I've been using the law as my blueprint as to how I'm going about this work. Um, so focusing first, uh, on getting our committee and our social justice and racial equity committee seated, um, as required by the law, uh, then getting our racial equity leads, um, on, and they are 30, uh, and they're on pretty strong and all very excited. They have gone through their first round of training, which is racial equity Institute training. And that was received really well. Um, maybe Selena will speak a little bit about that later. Uh, and we'll start their next phase of training, uh, in November 2nd. Um, doing basically learning how to facilitate these conversations on race. They will be uh, tasked with having core groups uh, in their departments of 10 or more that will identify the, um, the policies, procedures, and practices that they are then going to um, dismantle and, re and rebuild. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. That will start, like I said, on November 2nd. They'll do that facilitation training, and then they'll get to the operationalizing. Um, and the, the reason I, I really wanted to start with them is because I wanted to get them on track to start to really get our racial equity and social justice plans as soon as we can. Those, uh, their leads and the department heads are, um, and dismantle and puts them, 
um, some policies in place that we hopefully will see some outcomes from soon. Um, we are, uh, as, as Bob said, not yet done with our regs. Uh, that has been, I'll be honest with you, it's been, I would like to be as thoughtful as possible about that process. The regs require a good amount of detail as I was talking to our county attorney's office. Um, and I would like to get to have a thought partner, which is the money that you all set aside for your supplemental uh, for, for me to do. And I'm also open to having thought partners on your side of the street. So perhaps um, we can talk about what that looks like um, and working together on these regs. Um, but that is uh, in the works. We are also um, working, continuing our relationship with the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. Uh, we have started our implementation cohort. Last year, we had our initial introduction cohort, uh, which was 14 uh, members, including directors um, and uh, Elaine Bonner Tompkins from from the OLO, from OLO, um, and our our own PIO folks and other folks who are uh, not necessarily directors of departments, but very much influential in how they will take this work back and deliver it uh, to date. As far as resources, we have uh, we are in, we have actually made a offer <laughs> to our to our first candidate. I'm so happy about that. Uh, when I say we for the past six months, I really have just meant me. Um, and that means that, you know, I'm the hiring manager, I'm the procurement officer. I have been doing quite a bit of um, heavy lifting and establishing this office and establishing the infrastructure, um, as well as doing the work of gathering uh, our racial equity leads, leading our um, our racial equity and social justice committee. So I'm very eager <laughs> to have staff. Uh, we will have, we will start uh, interviews for our next FTE next week. Uh, and then our ad releases for our very last um, FTE uh, later next week as well. So we are moving, we are moving. Uh, and um, wanna thank you all again for your acknowledgement of the fact that this work needs resources. This work needs support. Um, I will say uh, in the region, this county has had very little um, resistance from, from our senior level um, leaders. Uh, like yourself, uh, Councilmember Navarro, and uh, and so that has really been a, a great, I will say, boost for the county. Um, in the last few months, it has been an incredible lift for all racial equity and chief equity officers around, around the country. I'm in contact with my peers probably weekly, um, and the capacity and the need and the, the sheer desire uh, to do this work and to have people just um, understand what it takes to do this work has been immense. Uh, I, I, again, I thank you guys for your work. Um, and also, I'm really excited to see what the Office of Legislative Oversight has been doing. Um, I've received uh, some of the, uh, the racial equity impact assessment framework from Elaine, and I am incredibly excited and think that that is actually uh, going to be quite I think quite the resource, not just for the county, quite frankly, but for the country. So um, I'm excited about where we're going. I um, I anticipate that we, um, you know, depending on what the year looks like, may or may not need resources. I am just starting to analyze that and actually have a meeting with my OMB uh, analysts right after this, of course, to talk about what our first quarter has looked like and and where we're going. So. Um, thank you again for your support. And if you guys have any questions, I'm open to that. Thank you so much, Ms. Ward. I um, really, truly appreciate everything that you have done. I think that, you know, something that you said is, is just so important because this year in particular, you know, I have gotten so much feedback from a lot of young people, you know, in their workplaces, people of, people of color. And there are workplaces where there is this notion that all of a sudden there is this expectation, right, that the whoever is the person of color in a particular space now is supposed to be the one to come up with all the plans and to educate everybody. And, yeah. and it's yeah. a really difficult thing. And it's and it's unfair. It's completely unfair mm -hmm. to expect now, you know, that, uh, oh, wait, we had this renewed, you know, reckoning with. Uh, systemic racism. So now who's the person of color in my office? And oh, come here and now educate all of us. 
especially when there aren't the resources and the capacity is not there. And so I want to be very sensitive to that as we embark in this journey, because in some ways we were, you know, super fortunate that we did a lot of heavy lifting last year. Um, you know, when I think back, I'm just like blown away by the fact that I feel very strongly that we needed to do this work, not knowing what was obviously none of us, none of us knew what was going to ensue in 2020. So we, as you said, I think in many ways are ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember having conversations with the community also saying, look, we're super fortunate because like the entire leadership is committed to this. Yep. In so many other jurisdictions, there would be impetus to do it, leadership would change, they would go back to status quo and that, you know, starts and, and, and just not continuity here, actually the entire leadership was like, we have to do this. And so as you meet with your OMB person, the other piece I would encourage you to also explore um, is what do we have in place? And that's, that's Fez. What do we have in place right now? within the administration that can um, that we can leverage. So it's not just about additional resources, but you know, what else, what other capacity do we have in place as well? Um, I think that would be really important for us to look into. That's actually a, a great point. So to that point, I've been working, um, having conversations with Jim Stowe, our head of human rights, and with Angela Washington, our EEO officer to talk about what we can do as three offices um, to put together a training program for social justice. Um, Jim Stowe and his shop has been doing implicit bias training for quite a while, though it hasn't been as prominent, I think, as it should be. Um, and then Angela has been also doing work in her shop. So I'd like to get together with the three of those offices and put together a training um, module, basically, uh, that really focuses on social justice. We are actually, we have another meeting later this week. Uh, to talk about what that would look like, um, how that would be delivered, and then how we would basically track that for for employees. So yeah, I'm I'm keen on that too, and thinking about the other infrastructures within other departments that can support me and have been supporting me um, to their credit uh, thus far. That's awesome. I mean, I, I again, I feel like we we are also very fortunate that we have amazing staff, uh, and um, you know. And I'm sure that there could be some really great opportunities like the one that you just described. Um, before I turn it over to um, Dr. Bonner Tompkins and then Ms. Singleton, you'd mentioned something about um, the work that you're doing ar ar around, I guess, educating staff um, uh, regarding this notion of system versus versus programmatic change. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on, on that? Sure. So there is a, you all went through the Racial Equity Institute training, and I'm not sure if you remember, but there is a session in the training that talks about the fish, the lake, and the groundwater. And the fish, the lake, and the groundwater setup is really about, right, are we treating fish? Are we treating the lake? Or are we actually getting to the root, which is the groundwater? And, um, and really having people understand that the racial equity work is about getting to the root. Um, and so that while, while fixing fish um, has its place, it will never get us to the closing the gaps that we that that exist, right? We have to start thinking about the system that we've created that have gotten us to this point. If you are, you know, have a lake and you have 50 fish that are belly up, if we're looking at the fish to find out which disease each single one of them has and not whether or not it is something in that lake that is poisoning them. So that has really been um, how we are trying to get staff to think. What is it in our atmosphere? What is it in our, our systems that are getting us the results that we are getting? And what, what can we change in our systems that can get us better results, not, oh, well, they aren't coming because they, they, they. And my, when I say they, I'm thinking of constituents, residents, right? Um, so what is wrong with them or what is not working for them? Uh, but what are we, what is not, what are we not providing? How are we, um, how are we not working best for this, for these populations? So that's what I mean when I say systems thinking, right? Um, and these are the things that we control, that we control in the day to day. Um, and so that is the shift that we're hoping to have everybody make so we can 
um, get to the root cause. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it is very important um, if for the millions at home watching, uh, famous famous quote here, Councilmember Jawando. But it is important for the public to to also understand how it is that we are approaching this work. Um, and and what I will say follow your description, you know, to that and how to really think through this notion of what are we treating exactly and we talk about the groundwater. I think that has been so evident during this pandemic that you know, when people think that it is okay to just treat certain aspects or have particular programs, et cetera, but not address the for you, this pandemic has demonstrated to us that because we haven't dealt with the, you know, root causes with that kind of groundwater, look at the effects of something like a pandemic where then it doesn't matter who you are. And at the same time, it totally matters who you are because having these disparities in our black and brown communities has a direct negative impact on the entire county. It's a virus. It doesn't stop to ask necessarily. And me in a perverse way, the pandemic I think has come to illustrate to everyone that it is incumbent upon all and that we should all be working diligently to address these structural issues because just like a pandemic, there are just a myriad of other issues that when we allow certain communities among us to be disproportionately affected, eventually it affects all of us as well. And so, so I think that, that kind of approach is, it's, it's hard, you know, to kind of, um, deal with on a micro level, but I'm really happy that it seems like to me, this, this is where we will arrive if we're serious about this. And, and lastly, but I'll say back to the capacity issue. Uh, in my staff, we were talking about, you know, where we're, we are, the status, and my chief of staff said, you know, you have to think about this, for example, as like when you have an audit function. In a way, this is like an audit function. And when you have an audit office, it's not just one or two people, right? Because if you do that, you basically are, you're pretty much patting yourself on the back and saying, hey, we're kind of doing this, and it's symbolic. This work is like when you have that kind of uh, charge and we should treat it as such. And so we need to make sure that both you and the legislative side have enough resources and capacity like an audit you know, office would to truly do this work because it is going to affect every single aspect of our counties, uh, of our county government and of our residents. So, so I just, before I, you know, lost that train of thought. I just wanted to put that out there because I hope that this is how we will proceed with treating this particular area and this work. Okay, um, let's see. So Dr. Bonner Tompkins, you wanna share with us where we are on the legislative side and then Mr. Holt uh, can also share some comments and Ms. Singles. Dr. Bonner Tompkins, Elaine, I think you're mute. Now, now, can you hear me? Awesome, awesome. So um, good afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity to um, update everyone on the work that we've been engaged in with the Office of Legislative Oversight to implement uh, the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. Um, we are charged to uh, develop racial equity and social justice impact statements for any bills introduced on or after August 1st, 2020. And toward that end, we have uh, one impact statement that is uh, posted on our web, and we have uh, three that have been um, shared with the County Council um, thus far. Um, we are fortunate that we were able to hire Dr. Theo Holt, um, who comes to us um, most recently from MCPS, but has a, a, um, a breadth of experience as both a veteran, a mentor, a teacher, also uh, trained as a psychologist um, and recently earned his uh, PhD um, late last year. And so we're fortunate to have him on board to help us uh, to uh, shape this work and do this work. Um, since we last met in June, uh, we have engaged um, in a number of training opportunities with um, staff in OLO, um, Central Council staff, as well as the legislative branch to really, um, as uh, Tiffany has shared as part of her um, 
the framework that the county uh, government is taking overall, sort of um, understanding that we need to begin with normalizing conversations about race. Um, and so um, using resources pulled together from the study circles team um, at MCPS, as well as some of the resources that the Government Alliance for Race and Equity has pulled together. Um, we did a series of trainings for staff to sort of build everyone's understanding about what we mean by racial equity and social justice, as well as what the requirements of uh, the law are. Um, similar to the comments you were just making, um, Chair, around uh, the need for uh, everyone to sort of have ownership of racial equity and social justice for really um, for all of us to work on the systemic change that's required. Uh, we saw in OLO as a requirement um, really that everyone understand what, what this means for them. Um, I think our expectation in this work is not only that um, we're able to apply racial equity and social justice lens to legislation as it's developed and introduced, we really want council member staff um, central council staff, everyone to own what this means for their particular slices of uh, the work that they do. Um, and so it's, it's really, um, you know, towards that end, we thought it was important to host, I would say, maybe a half a dozen or so trainings over the summer. They all kind of blur, but those of us who are with me, it was usually Friday afternoons and we would do these sessions. So, um, we tried to build that awareness. Um, again, we've been fortunate to hire Dr. Holt to help us do this work. Um, we are um, also um, trying to figure out how to better engage um, community in the development of impact statements, particularly on the ones that we think will have sort of a major impact. Um, I will say to date, the four impact statements that we've done have really just been um, us as staff trying to figure these out. And we've been fortunate to be able to build off of the work um, that our office has done um, through Stephen Roblin with this economic impact statements. We really use that as sort of a beginning template to develop these racial equity and social justice impact statements. Um, in terms of challenges, I think for us, um, you know, we have the 21 day requirement between bill introduction um, from bill introduction where we need to get these statements done and um, we've been able to do that um, but you know we can foresee that there will be a challenges if there are you know several bills that need to be analyzed um, at the same time so we're trying to figure out a way to um, get some of that work done before a bill is actually introduced and the racial equity and social justice uh, legislative review tool uh, we see as a as a um, means of, of of moving towards that direction, where hopefully uh, bill sponsors um, can use that tool before it's introduced to help shape um, shape their bills and understand and address if there's any unintended um, consequences. Um, again, as um, Bill forty four twenty, um, you all are considering, uh, which would have uh, OLO do impact statements on um, zoning text amendments. Um, in that same vein, we're gonna try to figure out, you know, assuming that it passes, we'll try to figure out a way to work with planning so that some of that work can be done um, before um, the, those ETAs are introduced because, um, you know, we don't wanna hold up any processes and, and that 21 days is pretty tight. Um, and I think, oh, and then the last thing I just wanted to, uh, share in terms of challenges is that, um, you know, increasing the capacity in the county to have and report data that's disaggregated by race and ethnicity is, is, a, is a critical issue that um, needs to be addressed. And that's, again, a part of expanding the ownership of this issue to more than uh, just Tiffany's office or OLO. Um, as you've seen with the racial equity and social justice impact statements that we've released to date, we really try to center it around um, what are the data re regarding disparities on the issues that are covered um, by those bills. And, um, you know, right now we just don't have a repository of, of this data. So, um, you know, fortunately I've been here for quite some time, so I have some institutional knowledge about where to find data. Um, but, you know, that's going to, um, you know, be an increasing concern, just trying to um, get this data, have people understand that it's important. Um, we, over the summer, did have conversations with um, 
analysts from both central council and OMB to try to figure out um, if there's disaggregated data being collected among departments. Also, uh, Dave Geisman did a survey of county departments to get a sense of what data is being collected. And, and overall, it's very, it's very minimal. You know, essentially, we know how things work. If there's not a federal requirement or a state requirement to report this data, um, then it's usually not um, reported. So we just, uh, that's another challenge to sort of figure out how to increase the capacity of departments to collect and report on this data because it's essential to us being able to do any kind of analysis around what we think will be the racial equity or social justice impact of legislation, policy decisions, budgets, the whole nine. So um, that's all I wanted to share. So thank you. Thank you. Is county, how is county stat interacting in terms of this issue of the data collection? Have they been part of that conversation? So they have been a part of the conversation. Um, we, we, all of the conversations, I was fortunate to have a summer fellow, um, a council fellow, uh, Julia Bauer, who assisted me over the summer in um, trying to compile some of this information. And uh, Dave Geisman was a part of each of those conversations. And then um, after, uh, after we had those conversations in August, he uh, did a survey of all his departments to try to figure out uh, what they were collecting. So um, we have some of the results from that, but it's still pretty, um, it's still not quite what we need in terms of, of understanding what they have and being able to use it. So it's, it's sort of a start point for future conversations. Um, but really the purpose in my mind of that survey and our conversations with the analysts is really just for them to, to set the expectation that this is something that mm -hmm. we're gonna need and something that you mm -hmm. wanna pay attention to and help you know um, start uh, collecting it. So um, yes, County Stat has been a part of these conversations. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Holt. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, I feel as if Dr. Brown Tompkins covered everything I was going to say. Um, I just want to reinforce the need for the data from the different departments because it's imperative to our work. So, yeah, but she covered everything. No, thank you. Well, well, we look forward to working with you uh, as we embark in, in this extraordinary journey. So, yeah, thank so you. Thank you for that opportunity, of course. Right. Uh, Ms. Singleton, what can you share with us in terms of? Uh, the uh, council side as well in your participation. Oh, you're can't hear you for some reason. Yeah, I don't know for some reason it shows that you're not mute, but we don't we're not hearing you. No, nothing. Does that work? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> now the whole house can hear me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I was just saying, you know, I don't have much to add, but because Ms. Ward did mention it, I did want to say that, you know, I'm at least grateful to have been able to, to participate in the Racial Equity Institute trainings, and especially where they delved into the the history where the history really does inform what happens in the present and the inter intersectionality between housing and education and employment and training, I think is so important to what the council is and has been doing and will be doing in the future. And so, you know, I just continue to look forward to working with uh, Ms. Ward and Dr. Bonner Tompkins and now Dr. Holt on this issue and sharing more information with the uh, council staff. Great. And so it's been a productive uh, process then in terms of how our, the remaining of our staff, right? Because you're the person who's assigned to interact with staff, et cetera. And so you feel that that's been going pretty good? It has been, yes. Wonderful. Really appreciate you volunteering to do this on top of everything else that you do and you do it so well. So we really do appreciate it. Okay. Um, I have Councilor Jawando who's told me he wanted to speak. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for letting me join the GEO committee. Uh, and Dr. Tompkins, Father Tompkins, Dr. Holt, good to meet you. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, Director Ward and Ms. Singleton, good to see you all, uh, as well as my colleagues. A couple questions. Um, I was glad to read the year end report and 
hear, Ms. Ward, that you're, you know, charting the path from the legislation, which is always a good good thing to do. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, a couple questions related to that. Um, the method two, I know Mr. Drummer mentioned them, uh, and I think, you know, we've referenced it, and it's something that we're all very interested in, the regulations laid out in the law. So what's the status? And, and you know, I, I, I always hesitate on timeline, but if you're able to give one of where things are, are they drafted and just being reviewed? Or no. where, where are we at on that? They are not yet drafted. Um, the timeline I would give would be the winter of this year. So it would be, um, I would say, late uh, December, early January uh, for delivery. Um, and really, I would say that you know, part of it is thought partnership and that I really do want to be thorough about how we address um, these regs. Our legislation is pretty prescriptive. It lays out that we must put in there how we are addressing the metrics, what the metrics are for each department, what the metrics are, um, how we are going to have people lay out their racial equity and social justice plans, particular strategies, not just tools. Um, that we are, um, that where we want people or departments to, how, the, how we want them to frame their racial equity and social justice plan. Um, so I think for me, that has been, um, I don't want to do that in a vacuum. And I'm, I'm going to be very frank. I don't want to do that solo. And I don't, I think that that is really um, kind of outside of the spirit of racial equity, if I'm honest with you. I, I think that we need, um, I need some thought partnership. I am definitely open to not just using the consultant that we have um, coming on board, but also to working with council staff um, and even and Dr. Uh, Bonner Tompkins and, and thinking about and laying out um, our regs. When our regs are done, I think they will be a one of a kind in the country. As far as I can tell, I've, I've looked <laughs> a good number of places trying to figure out um, who's as thorough um, as this, this legislation calls for. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I appreciate that. I think, you're underscoring one of the main issues here of how to make this really have the teeth and be as meaningful and as deep uh, and as both prospective and retrospective right. as it needs to be. And I, I do think that how these plans are, how the regulations are developed, which direct here, like what are our metrics, what's success yeah, look absolutely. like? Absolutely. Uh, what, how are you going to get there? Those are those are very important questions that could, depending on how it goes, and I know it's your intention and all of our intention to make sure it goes in a way that is meaningful. You know, so I, I, I would be interested, whether it's through the consultant, and you can get back to us, but I know I would have thoughts, and, our, and I know okay. council staff, another council member would have thoughts, and, you know, it just, to, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm open to that and uh, and we'll work with uh, any of your staff to set up a timeline or to, to have conversations uh, about what you would like to see or how you would like to see uh, these regs kind of laid out. And there, I mean, there are lots of the short-term and long-term goals. That's, that's you know, I have ideas of what those short sure. and long-term goals should be, but I think that we need input um, and not just from uh, ourselves, but even from the, from our community to some extent. And I'm not, I think that there's space for a strategic plan, which I am planning on for my next year, um, believe it or not, and how we go about fulfilling all of that. So yes, I um, just, you know, give me a call or send me an yeah. email and sure. uh, we can all do this in a more private setting um, yes. to talk about oh, what this looks like. And I'm happy to do that. And it relates to my second point, and I wanted to, I'm glad I have the, my, the committee here. You know, I'm just discussing with council member Navarro, you know, going back two years now, what would be the council's role? And, and the law lays out, okay, the council has to not only fund this thing appropriately, which we've been working hard to do, but how? Will, what will the council structure, in addition to the uh, reports that OLO is doing, how will we conduct our oversight and have a, a focused you know, set of either council members, a committee or something, and different options have been discussed. So I, I didn't know, again, something we can talk about, but I wanted to raise for Council Member Navarro and the, the GO committee, this idea of kind of an ad hoc, which Council Member Navarro has talked about, uh, racial equity and social justice committee that can provide that level of oversight um, and suggestions in some sort of formal capacity. It's just something for us to think about as we're all doing the work. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up. And, you know, in, in um, my notes, I, I, I was going to have, you know, the conversation about the timeline for the regs. Um, 
I think obviously I've been very, very mindful of the fact that this has been such a strange year <laughs> to say the least. And so I have had to be appreciative of the notion that it has derailed a lot of, you know, things just because of the focus on the response to the pandemic. Um, and that goes to this conversation about the regs. I mean, under normal circumstances, I would be here demanding that this happens like ASAP because the more time that goes, though, you know, the, the, the more that we're making decisions without the benefit of a lot of that information, which is the, the crux of this legislation. And so we have to have that, we have to find that balance between you know, being deliberate in terms of your work to um, Ms. Ward about the regulations and the fact that we have to get going here. So this is about the decisions that are being made, right? But I am also at the same time, you know, respectful and sensitive to the notion that it's been a crazy time. And uh, therefore, you know, um, I will be patient. Now, going back to the uh, thing about, the question about the legislative arm I, you know, I would very much like for us to um, evolve into what I have proposed that last year when I was president, that we could get to a point where we might have an additional committee um, that could look at strategic, um, you know, sort of a strategic plan or vision for the county, um, as well as the racial equity and social justice law. It does not, not necessarily for for a committee to be meeting like every week, you know, maybe it's like a by, you know, by monthly or something like that, but to track our progress on things like the economic development platform or, you know, whatever large strategic um, tools that we put in place or plans, I think we do need to have those types of uh, mechanisms to see where we are. S same thing with the racial equity and social justice work, you know, to see, hey, so, Let's pick in, let's figure this out, et cetera. So I'm still open to that. I, but again, I feel like because of the pandemic, our work has really been focused a lot on responding and, you know, putting forth all these special appropriations. Nonetheless, I think it's a very useful conversation that, you know, we should have when we have our next retreat as a council um, to then decide, you know, we're now ready. I think, I think the, you know, the implementation and, and the pieces, you know, um, are, are, are in place now. I mean, I'm, I feel pretty good about what we're doing on the legislative side. I know, I mean, we're going to be hiring somebody on the on the council to actually um, be that racial equity and social justice, uh, you know, lead on it, if you will, of sorts. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. Um, I think there are enough pieces in place where we can now have the conversation about how do we um, institutionalize the oversight structure uh, on the council. So, so I'm still open to that, uh, Councilmember Jawando, and I hope again that you know when, when we have the next retreat, we could we could discuss this. And with Ms. Ward, you know, obviously, you know, same thing. I mean, my office is very interested in sure that we provide you with as much you know input and and support regarding this, these uh, regulations. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Otter Tompkins and Dr. Holt, you know, as well. Um, because we really do need to to, to meet that deadline. Um, as you recall, the council was very deliberative in um, not requiring the impact notes until August, even though we passed the bill in March, because we were sensitive to the notion that this was going to take a little bit of time to stand up, um, and therefore um, we should not, you know, wait too much longer so we can get into this rhythm of uh, legislating, but also um, any programmatic decision or any budgetary decision needs to have this information so that we can get into that um, habit of making sure that this is how we, we do our work. Um, so absolutely. One, one, one more yes, brief comment. Of course. I, and thank you for that. I, and I agree, it is a good retreat discussion. And I'm not wedded to what the former structure is. It could be informal or formal. I just think mm -hmm. we need to have something to your point to institutionalize the, the oversight um, in a way that, that uh, leverages what we've already started with Dr. Holt and Dr. Tompkins and, and the work Ms. Ward's doing. On the, I did want to say, I've been very pleased, and I just want to publicly say what I've been saying privately with OLO's racial equity impact statements and the, the level of detail and data that you've been able to pull together and um, 
I was so pleased that on one bill, I was like, I wish I would have had it sooner, you know? And so I think, so, and, and realizing the capacity issues uh, on whether it be, there's a, a lot of bills and ZTAs and, and uh, expedited bills, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point. That's something I've, I've thought about and I'm concerned about too. And, you know, I think we might have to be creative as we go along and see what happens of, making sure you have the either consultants or outside resources. I know we met with the University of Maryland a while back and to see if, if they could help or, you know, we might need to expand over time. Um, and I also wanted to m mention the data point. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm working on a bill, as you know, Dr. Tompkins, to implement the OLO recommendations from the report I asked for on police data, which is just one part of the picture. And there are many areas where we don't connect collect race and ethnicity or consistently or at all. And this bill will clean that up and add other areas, even in addition to some that were added in the community policing bill and, and covering some additional gaps. But that's just one area. And I, I think we need to consider even whether it's a, a bill or related to, um, you know, county stat, we need to kind of fundamentally go through that and help with your help identifying the areas where we don't have uh, th that data. And I think we need to make sure that, that we do and pass that and have that be codified. And I, so I would love to work with, I guess that would be a geo committee thing, but I just think we need to, like we're doing with this uh, bill, I'm working on with Mr. Cat, the public safety committee and to implement those OLO recommendations for police. I think we need to do that across the board. So I hope we can work on that as well. Yeah. And, you know, as she was mentioning this, I, it occurred to me that because we have, um, a bill in this moment in time that will amend the racial and social justice law, you know, if we have the ability, perhaps we can include, you know, as we are going to amend for, to require for CTAs and, and, and the uh, membership of the committee, that maybe we can include in that bill um, another uh, provision addresses the issue of data. So, Majora, you're absolutely right um, in the company this. So, you know, I had kind of jotted that down as, as a possibility because we have this mechanism right in front of us right now. It would be a good moment to take advantage of that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Council, uh, Council President Katz. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that every uh, statement everybody makes now is, am I off mute or can you hear me? That's everybody's statement. So, um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, it's always good to see everybody, but Ms. Ward and Dr. Bonner Tompkins and Ms. Singleton, I guess we see you more than we see anybody else. I mean, uh, as the as the clerk, but Dr. Holt, you and I are, I, I'm, it's good to meet you. You and I have been uh, email partners, I guess, for uh, um, for quite some time. So it's good to actually meet you and thank you for all your, your work. I, I just wanna stress that the whole idea of resources is an extremely important uh, discussion. Because if you don't have the resources, we expect we expect what we what we need to be being able to be done. And if you don't have the resources, it's not fair to you, and it's not fair to us. So you need to constantly, please, remind us of what you need, and and maybe we can't provide it all. But if we don't know of it, we certainly can provide. So I I know you're not shy, but please do not do not let that happen. And this whole process, I, I have been, from the very beginning of it, you know, I, I, I have been so impressed. I, candidly, and, and my colleagues have heard me say this many times, and I'm going to be as brief as I can possibly be on this, but I, I thought, candidly, I, I knew about this topic. I really did. I mean, I, somebody that grew up in Montgomery County, I'm somebody that's, that's lived the life of Montgomery County. I'm somebody that, that pride, prided themselves on, the, on the, the people I've known and the friends I have. And, and I really thought I knew about social justice and racial equity. I, I really did. But the more I've learned, the more I've learned that I didn't know. And I'm not saying I didn't know anything because I did know some things, but I certainly didn't know enough. And that is what we are after. And, and I've had friends, good, good conversations, want to have good conversations, that I said, why are you doing this? You know, it's, whether it was necessary or whether it wasn't necessary. But when you get into what we are doing and how we are doing it, they then start to see 
a light bulb go off. And that's what's happened with me. Far, I'm far from an expert, and I don't want to pretend that I am. But the education of this, to me, is the most powerful tool that any of us can have. And, and I believe that we need to continue to do that. I think we need to do it um, on a, on, literally on a daily basis, perhaps even on an hourly basis. But, but we need to continue to do that. We need to work together. We need to understand that some people don't necessarily, who, who have good hearts, who believe that they understand, don't necessarily understand it all and therefore need to be helped with their education as well. So I think that not only are we helping ourselves, not only are we helping Montgomery County, but we're helping each other, of course, in so many ways, but we're actually helping each little step gets us a little further in this journey. So I really do appreciate everything everybody's doing. And I know there's some days that it's, you know, that you, that you figure that, that this is a, is a tough mountain to climb. And then the only other thing I'm going to ask or say is that if you were, and, and this is still new in many ways, but if you were going to rewrite anything of this, of this legislation, what have you learned so far? And if it were you rewriting this, if it were you writing this, was there anything at this point that you believe we need to, to look at again to get us to a different spot? So thanks. Anybody have any thoughts? Dr. Uh, Lane, yes. So okay. just really, um, it's really just sort of the, the timing of us having to do so just to, just to couch it, you know, OLO has a very small piece of the act that we have to implement. So um, I recognize that and, and understand that the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice has the yeoman's load of, of, how, of what to do to implement it. Um, but given our little slice, I would just say uh, the timing of trying to do um, these impact statements as they get more, um, as we have bills that are more complex and, and sort of more comprehensive, that 21 days is, is really um, gonna be a, a challenge. We're gonna do it. Um, but just sort of the quality of what we can do if we're having to do a lot of them um, might be a, a, a little diminished. And, you know, we, we like our standards in OLO, as you guys do as well. Sure. Um, so, yeah, just so trying to get some of that work done before the introduction is, is really um, what we're trying to push. Okay. Thank you. Um, so if, for example, you have a thought on that. I mean, obviously, what we're trying to do is to make sure the council members uh, and the public uh, has this information, right, in front in order to inform the decisions, which right. in turn is tied to the legislative sort of schedule, right? So, you know, introduce the bill, you have then these days for public hearing, then you have these, and then you have the sessions. And so, I mean, if you have any thoughts on whether this could be, again, you know, modified in some sort without altering the fact that we have to follow the legislative timeline, um, you know, that would, I think, also be a good uh, component for this bill that's amending those pieces um, as well. And, and I would say in general, you know, if there are things that, for, I don't know how, for example, it did not it was on my radar that we had not included ZTAs. For some reason, I the whole entire time, I thought it was there. Mm -hmm. It was like, what? No, this is huge, you know? So if there are, are any other kinds of uh, those types of, you know, pieces as to what Council, President Cass was saying, that we can then modify, I think we have an opportunity with this, you know, with this particular bill. And, and you know, we don't want to set ourselves up for failure at the same time, you know, there's a particular purpose here. So, mm -hmm. Ms. Ward, any thoughts? Gosh, um, I think, I mean, I think the bill is pretty prescriptive. I think for me, uh, it really, um, I, I think people should understand that this is about building blocks, that there are certain things that we won't be able to, that we have to do first before we get to uh, the metrics and get to outcomes. And so that has been my task is, um, is really trying to, um, make sure that we are building this uh, at a pace and at a reasonable pace and then also getting to the outcome. So for me, um, 
maybe just a little bit more leeway or maybe things that aren't as prescriptive. Uh, I'm not being as articulate as I want here as I think about the bill in my mind. Um, so I was just like, maybe I'll send over a memo <laughs> uh, that, that gives some ideas of, you know, if we had to do it all over again, um, this is what I think would, would kind of suit us better, especially as the racial equity uh, world, I think has just kind of changed and lit on fire, right? This the um, notion of social justice and, and who should be even on our racial equity and social justice committee. I mean, that's very prescriptive in our, in our legislation. So um, perhaps we, you know, or widen that definition, right? Um, so, um, but yeah. that was all as, but that was all in response to what. Yeah, no, I get it. Community required. So, so, so be, be so, clear. Yeah. I think we did yeah. really well. Be clear. I think we did really well uh, in our in this in this first iteration of this bill. But as I think yeah. about how it has um, played out, uh, yes. I, I think about some of those. Um, you know, some of the folks who don't feel so included. So that's, yeah, um, that's how I feel. So I think, but I think all in all, we are, we are managing or trying to manage as is. But if I think that there are other big amendments, I like the idea of the data inclusion. That is going to be a big win, not just for OLO, but quite frankly, for the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, as we start to think about metrics, as I've started to think about metrics, right? And how we're going to actually know if we're getting ahead. We don't have some, we're not measuring many times. Right. So some folks just simply are not looking at how um, they're serving uh, residents and breaking down by race, by socioeconomic status, by ethnicity. And so just getting that data is, is a big racial equity win, quite frankly. So um, I will I just want to second that um, from Dr. Bonner Tompkins, that that would be a very big win for us. Um, and, you know, and working with departments to to do that in a way that is uh, as easy as possible. There's going to be work required, but um, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I do also want to mention that we do have a, a baseline report. That was one of yep. the great work that the Office of Legislative Oversight uh, took and it's on been, as well. Yeah, it's been great. Um, as when we get into these departments and look at our, how mm -hmm. we're serving constituents, we, it'd be great if we had, mm -hmm. you know, disaggregated data. That's what this is all about. Yeah. Councilor Friedson. Yeah, thank you so much. Just uh, kudos again to uh, Chair Navarro for her leadership uh, on this and uh, to all of you for your role in, in implementing it. I, I think this is you know, tr truly takes a village. Uh, it's part of what this is about is you know what our village actually is and who's included in it and uh, who has a role in determining what the uh, the, the, the rules and, uh, and and the things that we do in it, and so uh, you know I think this really is a good exercise. I, um, you know, we all are uh, frustrated at times with the speed of implementation, and so hopefully we can continue to push the envelope on that and make sure that we're doing things right, but that we're doing things uh, well because uh, there are no issues that are um, uh, more obvious in terms of the need to implement them in a timely manner than things like justice because uh, delay is denial and um, you know these things are important um, you know I, I also think that it's important that we have been quick to tweak and to make changes and to address some of the, the challenges I don't think anybody ever thought that there were silver bullets to these issues I think we all recognize that we're trying to create a structure and a framework and um, there are lots of holes and lots of things and you can't include everybody and you can't include everything and sometimes you realize uh, that you left some things out and you wrote things the wrong way. And you know, I think we're going to have to continue to do that. I, I don't anticipate that uh, this latest tweak is the last formal change that this effort is going to require. And I think we all have to be uh, humble enough in our uh, approach to this that we're willing to take feedback from the community and from stakeholders and uh, see what works and see what doesn't work. And I think so far you know, that's been a real positive here. I don't see that as a failure. I see that as a success that we were able to identify uh, some of these things early on and quickly uh, adapt uh, to them in a way that strengthens uh, the effort keeping the spirit but fixing the details so um, I'm encouraged I, I think that these uh, briefings have been helpful I thought the last briefing was very telling it was frustrating aspects of it but very telling I think it has helped to move things along to get us all rowing in the same direction I mean this is a legislative OLO 
executive branch, you know, everybody working together, needing to make uh, this thing happen and uh, bringing in some outside help, uh, which we appreciate uh, and know we need as well. And uh, Dr. Holt, thank you for uh, for your work and your leadership and your expertise. And I uh, just, um, you know, appreciate all of the efforts that are happening and look forward to continuing what will be a journey. As we have said, I think uh, Ms. Ward, I think the comment privately that I shared publicly at her uh, um, um, uh, hearing was, uh, or interview, I should say, um, you know, was about how, you know, 400 years of uh, challenges don't get fixed in 400 minutes or 400 days or 400 weeks. And so, um, you know, we, we need to, you know, move forward, make progress, and uh, recognize that these are big issues that require big solutions. They start with small details. So uh, thanks uh, for, for all of that work and uh, let that work continue. Thank you. And no, I, I actually don't see this as a failure at all. I, I, I'm actually so excited and so proud of this work because like you were saying, Councilmember Friesen, I mean, you know, what I remember when I sat down with folks in King County and it, they were like, it took us 10 years, you know, to, to get to the plate, the point of legislation. Um, you know, we've done this, I think, um, we, we, we've been so committed to this and, and the product that we have out, you know, right now and the results that we have are, are amazing. Um, so, and yeah, this is going to be a very deliberative and, uh, you know, thoughtful process, um, but one that is absolutely necessary. And, um, you know, so towards that end, I, I'm, I'm very happy where we are. Um, Again, we'll circle back and figure out what we can do to support you, Ms. Ward, in terms of the method two regulations so that we can get that done. Um, I, I when, I, when you know, Council President was talking about some of the folks that might ask, you know, why, and I, I keep thinking back about the the role that the pandemic has played. I said that at the very beginning that, you know, for me, if anybody ever asks me why, I, I think that's what I would say. You know, I would say look at what's happening right now, you know, look at, look at why it is that, that everybody needs to do this work because today it's a pandemic, tomorrow it'll be something else. So whatever the reason is, people need to understand that, you know, dismantling these structures are critical and working on these issues is absolutely imperative. Um, it's something that is playing out right now in this country uh, and in the world, uh, very much so. So, you know, it, 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 it is absolutely, in my opinion, some of the probably the most important work that uh, government should be doing right now uh, as we speak. So so again, I'm super proud of everyone who's had um, a hand in getting us to this to this point. Um, so we'll work with you again. We'll circle back in terms of possible additional amendments that we could include in in the um, in the bill. Uh, and, um, and let's, let's keep going. And, and again, thank you all because going back to my original comment as well, I know that this, you know, gets a little exhausting <laughs> when, uh, you know, you're pulled in all these different directions because everybody wants to learn so much about these issues. And, and, um, I know everybody's very gracious, but at some point you have to say, you know, we, we, we can't have, we can't have that dual role all the time of uh, having to be part of, you know, all of members that, of these groups that are affected by these disparities and at the same time have to like, you know, educate everybody, but you all do it so graciously. And I, I know you do it because you understand that this is not about us. It is about this county uh, and, and the state and the, and the country. So that's a super, it's really awesome. So um, I don't have any other uh tweets, uh, tweets, <laughs> texts here. So uh, with that, I think that we are good. And again, thank you all. And, and we'll look forward to, to the work. Thank you so much. Thank we you. Are, we yeah. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>